Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached on June 18th, 2023, on the basis of 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 to 46. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from our one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our reading for today from 1 Kings chapter 18. When he, uh, Elijah, or when, when, sorry, when Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on, on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to him, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, and, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers with fire, he is God." Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning, that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water of the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go go, go and tell Ahab, 
Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds and wind rose. A heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. This is God's word. You may not uh, recognize the name Ephaltes of Trachis, but I'm going to talk to you about him a little bit this morning. Ephaltes of Trachis was a Greek man who lived during the time when the Greeks and the Persians were battling each other. The, the Persians were the, the world empire at this time, but the, the Greeks were, were rising to power. They were, they were starting to get their, their act together, and they would be the next one, history would, would tell. Uh, but right now, the, the Greeks were, were kind of the underdogs here, and they were fighting against the Persians. And the particular battle that we're going to talk about uh, took place at the, the, what's called the Trachinian Cliffs. And the Greeks had, had kind of strategically picked this spot because there was a point in the Trachinian Cliffs where it was pretty narrow. Only about the, the, the size of a carriage could, could fit through width-wise. And tactically, that worked out really well to the Greeks' advantage because they had a much smaller army against a much bigger Persian army. And so they came up with this, this plan. If they could hold off the Persians at this narrow pass and, and give time for their far superior navy to maneuver against the Persian navy, then they would be victorious. It was a great plan. And it was working, too. They had 4,200 soldiers who were holding their ground against a much larger Persian army at this narrow pass. That is until the Persians found a little-known goat trail that, that took them around the, the, the pass. They didn't find the pass on, on accident, and they didn't find it because they were really smart. They found it because Ephaltes of Trachis betrayed his Greek brothers and, and told the Persians in hopes of getting a huge payday about this little-known goat trail. And so when the, the Persians took that trail around, they were able to outflank the Greeks and when the Greeks realized it, they, they released their men from, from fighting. 3,900 of those men fled, and 300 of them stood and fought to the bitter end. This was the, the Battle of Thermopylae. It's a, it's a very well-known battle, and in, in history movies have been made about it. And it's a, it's a, a memorable story of betrayal. You might not have recognized Ephaltes' name as one of the great betrayers. Maybe you remember the story, but that's kind of a hard name to remember, right? But, but I'm going to guess that there are some uh, of the great betrayers of, of history that, that you would remember. Names like Benedict Arnold, or Brutus, or Judas Iscariot. Th these are kind of intriguing stories, these stories of betrayal, especially when they're real stories. They're, they're really in, intriguing because a betrayal is always somewhat shocking. There's always a, a bit of surprise in that. How could somebody who seemed to be so firmly planted on the American side turn to the, the Brit, British side during the Revolutionary War? How could somebody who, who claimed to be friends with, with Julius Caesar literally stab him in the back? How could someone who claimed to be a disciple of Jesus sell him out for just 30 pieces of silver. They're, they're always shocking because the, the, the person seems to be so firmly planted in one camp when really his heart is divided between the two. He has divided loyalties or he's given himself over completely to the other side. Keep those thoughts percolating in your, in your mind here and then remember Elijah's words to the people. He said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. So Elijah's saying this in this dramatic mountaintop scene. He's on Mount Carmel. He, he believes, he, he may very well may have been the only one of the Lord's prophets left. And he is there with 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, King Ahab, and then a large group of onlookers, a large crowd of, of the general population who are witnessing this whole scene. As he speaks these words, the, the how long will you waver in two opinions words, 
he seems to be talking to the, the general population there, the onlookers, and probably a little bit to King Ahab, too. We know that Elijah has not been shy in, in speaking the truth to King Ahab, and he, he's going to do it here, too. Because it, it appears like the, the people, and even King Ahab, may have recognized the one true God, and, and may have worshipped the one true God, but they also worshipped Baal and Asherah and all of these other gods as well. They also had all of these other idols connected to their hearts. Their, their hearts were divided. They had a, a foot in each camp. Which, which kind of leads us to what we want to discuss, the truth that we want to discuss. Hearts that are divided between God and someone or something else are hearts that have walked into idolatry. Idolatry is really just, just putting something, anything, a person or a thing in front of God. And, and idolatry is something that, that God does not tolerate. He, he's pretty clear in his word. In Deuteronomy, he wrote this. He said, fear the Lord your God and serve him only. He said only, right? He said, he said in a different place, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. God doesn't want to, to share you are to fear him only, you are to respect him only, love him only, serve him only. A divided heart violates the only. A divided heart is idolatry. And this idolatrous divided heart is really a betrayal of the one true God. And that betrayal is no small thing because that betrayal violates the only. Whether you have a foot in each camp or you're completely given over to the other side, it's a betrayal of our God. So, so hold that thought and let's go back to the mountain. We're on Mount Car Carmel. We have all these prophets over here and Elijah over here and the showdown is, is on here. And, and here, here are the terms. They're, they're each going to prepare a bowl as a sacrifice, but no one's going to set fire to either of the sacrifices Whichever God can send fire to, to light the sacrifices on fire, that is the one true God. And so uh, Elijah says, you guys got all the people, so you go first. You go first. So they prepare the bull. They prepare the, the, the altar for the sacrifice. And the, the prophets of Baal begin to cry out to Baal. They cry out to Baal and, and they start to dance around the altar. Can you, pic can you picture that? They're dancing around the altar. It says from morning to, to midday. So maybe from like 9 o'clock in the morning till noon. So they're doing this for a long time. And then at about noon, Elijah begins to kind of mock them a little bit because they haven't had a response yet. He begins to mock them, and, and, and so they cry out louder. They cry out louder, and they think, well, we, we got to show our act of devotion to, to Baal, so we're going to start to slash ourselves, cut ourselves. They're, they're going to show blood, like as if this act of devotion is somehow going to incline Baal's ear to listen to, to their cries. And of course, nothing happens. I, I don't know if this happens to you, but when, when these stories like this come up in the Old Testament about idols, they're kind of hard. They're kind of hard to apply to your own, your own heart. Uh, they seem kind of foreign to us. We understand intellectually the, the idea of idols and, and what an idol is. We've already talked about that, right? Um, but to, to apply God's words, God's harsh words against these idols for us, it's hard. And, and when we try to examine our own heart and we try to say, well, what are the idols that are, are lurking in my heart? What is my heart attached to uh, that, that's not God? Or what are the potential idols that, that could creep in to my heart it's hard to assess that because we don't have idols named Baal. Uh, we, we don't have idols. Uh, most of our idol, idols are probably not carved and fashioned out of wood or made into from some statue or something like that. And so as we are assessing our own hearts and the idols that lurk um, in our hearts, perhaps we should just ask ourselves a, a pretty simple question. What divides your heart? What are, you asking, what are you asking God to share your heart with? A person, a thing? What, what is it that Elijah would come to you and say, how long will you waver between two opinions? If, if the Lord is God, follow him. If blank is God, 
follow him? What, what would you fill in that, that blank with? I, I suppose it could be any number of things. I suppose at different times in life, you probably have different things that you could fill that blank in with. And a Christian never sets out to, to do that intentionally. A Christian doesn't sit down and say, it's in my five-year plan to introduce an idol into my life uh, this year, or, or in my 10-year plan to, to really get hooked on that idol. Uh, it, it often happens unintentionally. It, it often happens in a way that Elijah kind of describes. In, in the very beginning, in verse 17, when he's talking to Ahab, he says, you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. The, the word followed literally just means to walk after. Now, I, I don't know if this was true for, for Ahab. It, from what we know of Ahab, it maybe doesn't seem like this was true. He made some intentional uh, decisions along the way. Uh, but a lot of times, for, for Christians, it's, it's an unintentional thing. They're, they're walking after the Lord. They're following after the Lord. But, but then there's something enticing over here. There, there's something enticing over here, and, and you begin to walk after that. And you can't walk after both, so you end up walking after whatever this is that, that seems to be offering you something that God can't offer you. Or, or, or seems to at least be tricking you into thinking that, that this thing is, is better than, than God. You know, I, I kind of think it, it's a little bit of like what would maybe go through the heads of some of these great betrayers throughout history. I, I can almost see this conversation in, in their head. They were so firmly planted on, on one, one side, but then they, they perhaps started to, to entertain the, the thought, to entertain the thought of what it would be like to, to go over to the other side or, or what the other side could, could give them, how they might benefit if they they went over to that other side. And they, they let those thoughts linger for, for long enough that by the end of that, they've kind of justified the betrayal in their own mind. And by the time they get to, to actually carrying out that act of betrayal, they've probably convinced themselves that this was actually the right thing to do or that they had no other option. We can kind of do the same thing and, and we can kind of excuse the idols in our life, either by ignoring them or trying to justify the, the idols that exist in our own life that, that we ask God to share our heart with. But, but God is pretty unequivocal. Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Idolatry violates the only. Uh, idolatry is betrayal. And idolatry is loving a created thing more than the God who created that thing. But, but maybe we should ask, is that really fair? Is it fair of God to, to ask for our complete devotion for all of our heart? Is it fair for God to say, worship me only? Is that a fair thing? If God is who he says he is, then yes. If he's not who he says he is, then, then no. So the simple question is, is the all capital letter Lord, Yahweh, God, is he the one true God? Let's go back to the mountain. It's Elijah's turn now. He's just watched all of the, the, the prophets of Baal do their dancing routine and, and, and cutting themselves and all of this kind of thing, uh, and nothing has happened. And so it's his turn. He, he re rebuilds the altar that has been torn down. It kind of gives you a glimpse into what the religious life of the northern kingdom was like at that time. They had torn down the altar of the Lord. He rebuilds the altar, he prepares the sacrifice, and then he does something kind of unorthodox. He takes four large jars of water, and he pours that water, has that water poured over the, the sacrifice. And he does that three times, so 12, 12 jars of water over this. And this is enough water that it flows down off the side of the altar, and it fills up that trench that he has dug around. It seems kind of counterintuitive if you're going to start fire to something, you, you, you don't dump water on it first, right? Uh, th that's what Elijah does. And then he gets down and he, he prays. He, he doesn't cry out. He doesn't dance around the altar. He, he prays. Not, not for three hours, but for two sentences. And immediately, God opens the heaven, heavens, sends fire that consumes the sacrifice, consumes the, the wood that he had there, the stones, it consumes, even though it licks up even the water in the trench around. This was a remarkable thing, something that, that nobody had ever seen in their, their lifetime 
before, and it was proof beyond the shadow of a doubt that the God that Elijah served is the one true God. Those people got to see reality. That was always the case. He was always the one true God, but now with their own eyes, they got to see just how powerful this God is and just how true he actually is. You know, if you're like me, I, I kind of look at that and I say, you kind of wish for a, a Mount Carmel moment, don't you? Uh, where God would prove without a shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is the one and only God. But I'm going to make a kind of a wager with you. I don't think you're going to see something like that in your lifetime. I, I don't think fire is going to come out of, of heaven and God's going to prove himself in that way. But, I, but let me tell you, you have one better than that. You have one better that, than that because God has fulfilled his greatest promise and that has proved to, to you and, and to me that he is, in fact, the one true God. God. God made a promise back after Adam and Eve fell into sin that he was going to send his son to, to, to defeat the devil, that he was going to send his son to be the savior of the world. And, and all throughout the Old Testament, before Elijah's time and after Elijah's time, he renewed that promise again and again and again. And God made good on that promise at Christmas, when he sent his son to take on flesh, to live among us, just and be just like us, except to not sin, and then to offer his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and to rise from the dead, completing his work. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it's greater than anything that happened on Mount Carmel. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is surefire proof, proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus is who he says he was, that he is the one true God, and that he has come to save us. And so God doesn't just demand an undivided heart. You know what he does? He wins your heart. He works on your heart. He motivates your heart to love and serve him only. You kind of heard how the Elijah story wrapped up here. The people saw this, this miraculous thing and they, they, they fell prostrate to the ground, meaning they fell, fell on their face as an act of, of worship. They realized that the God that Elijah served was the one true God. And that was God's intent all along. He wanted to win the hearts of his people back. And, and then you saw that the, that the prophets of Baal and Asherah, they, they were punished for, for leading the people astray and killed. And then, what did God do? And maybe this, this is kind of connecting the last two weeks of, of Elijah's sermons with this one. They had been in a drought for three years. They, they had prayed to Baal, who they believed Baal to be the one who would send rain. Baal didn't send rain. Baal couldn't send rain. But God could. It, one of the big takeaways we can take today is don't look to anyone other than God to give you what only God can give you. But trust in him just like Elijah trusted him because he is your one true God. Amen. Hey, Pastor Wilkie here. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. You know, in our digital age, it's really easy to share some of this content. You can share it with a friend simply by sending it to them. You can tell them about it. Uh, or you can simply like or subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. That helps more people see this uh, content and, and hear about Jesus and his love more often. We hope you join us again next week as we, we dig into God's word yet again.